Hey guys, Graham here. I trust you are well. Happy Friday or whenever you're watching this. Uh, I come here every Friday to do a live AMA, Ask Me Anything. So try to take five questions from you guys, uh, my community and my partners uh, every week. So hey, if you have a question, feel free to add it to the comments while we're live or you can email me, just go to gjm.org, all of the ways of connecting with me are there. Hey, I'll be back at the end of this session as well with uh, just an offer we have at the moment and some news. But let me just mention again, if you're new to my YouTube channel, I'm really working this summer about building up the subscriber base and the watch time. So thank you all of you who've subscribed. If you haven't subscribed, why? Now, if you haven't subscribed, please consider doing that. Hit the red button down there in the corner and give the bell a long press for about two or three seconds. And I would really appreciate that. And uh, probably the best way of connecting with me, if, if you go to gjm.org, gjm.org. Links are in the show notes uh, for our email newsletter, the School of Ministry, some of the events. I'm going to be speaking in Pennsylvania this weekend. Um, so all of that good stuff. Good. Well, I'm going to jump into the questions I have here. Chance for a cup of tea. Mm. So, um, first question I have here from Matt. Hey, Matt, how are you doing, mate? Is how do we grow as Christians? Other than reading the word, how do we grow? It's a great question. Um, let me give you five quick answers to that. But before I do that, I let me just take a couple of moments to speak about the need to grow. You know, if there's two... I like to say if there's one word and maybe two words that God is speaking to the body of Christ, I think it's this, grow up. Yeah, you have, uh, there are two massive camps within Christianity. And then there's some of us who are in a tiny third camp. The camps go like this. There's a lot of the church that basically says God's got all of this awesome stuff for us, the church. But it will happen after we die or after Jesus returns or in the millennial. It's sort of this camp that says, guys, we've just got the Bible right now. Jesus has left us. Hunker down. Make it through. You know, just don't stick your head above the paraplete. It's the Alamo mentality that we're left here. God is of the sacred flame. And one day Jesus is going to return for us and it will become all cool. And we'll, we'll step into the fullness of all God's got for us. Group number one, I reject that with every atom of my being. There's a second group who are much more akin to where I am. Many kind of charismatics, some of the pro house movements, whatever, that say, no, there's this glorious revival coming. Jesus isn't coming back for a beaten up church. He's coming back for a glorious bride. And we don't have to wait till we die of the millennial for the world to see a church that looks and acts and thinks and speaks and smells like Jesus. I say amen to those brethren. Here's where I draw a, a line of differential between myself and some of those guys. I think some of them say, well, what we've got to do is we've got to pray for revival. If we get enough people in enough football stadiums asking God to send revival, send revival, send revival, send revival. And in a way, they're saying, no, there is this glorious move of God that's out there. But what we've got to do is either wait for it or call for it or um, get ready for it or just keep imploring God to do it. And then I think there's a third group. <laughs> I I am I I reject both of those premises. I don't think we need to wait for anything. And I also don't believe we need to beg God for anything. I think he's already given it. John 1 verse 12 verse 16 of his fullness have we all received. Mm. Colossians 1 um, 9 and 10 in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The next verse says you are complete in him. And my theology and I'm right. <laughs> I really mean that is this, that, that God's given everything Jesus had. He emptied himself of at Calvary, that you and my I might have that fullness. Now, the fullness of the new creation, the fullness of his righteousness, the fullness of his spirit. It's not coming one day. It's already here. We don't need in a way to ask God to pour out his spirit. God poured out his spirit on the day of Pentecost. What we need to do, here's the key. Galatians says that when you're a if you're a child born in the royal house, for instance, but you're still a child, you, you're still under tutor, you're under a nanny, you're not, although you're like a little Prince William, Prince Harry, whatever, until you come to maturity, you don't get to exercise the authority and power you have. So I think God's given everything we need, all things that pertain to life and godliness come through the knowledge of him, it's called the Bible, who calls us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. So 
I think that in a way God's God's already done all he needs to do. What the church needs to do is grow up. I think God has the vehicle there, the car keys. The car is gassed up, if you will, ready to go, but he's not going to give the car keys to a five-year-old. And so the the issue is not waiting till we die or waiting to try to get God in a good mood and beg him to give something that he's already given. The issue is you and I growing and getting to the place where God can release us. We grow up. The goal of the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, they're not there to do the work of the ministry. They're there to equip the body to do the work of the ministry. What does the next verse say? Paul's fatigue. That we be no longer children, tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine, but speaking the word, the truth, in the context of love, that's church, that's relationship, we would grow up into him, grow up into him to the stature of the fullness of the measure of Christ. Paul says uh, in 1 Corinthians 13, doesn't he, when I was a child, I had the language of a child. I had the reasoning, the epistemology, the understanding as a child, and I engaged with childish thoughts. And then he said, but when I grew, I put away from me childish things. I'm not answering your question here, Matt, but I'm just agreeing with you, man. We need to grow up. So often people will come into my office where I am right now and they're, they're saying, cast this out of me and pray that I'll be free out of that and pray that I'll get over this situation. And, you know, we can help people to a measure. There are some things, though, you don't need deliverance of. You just need to grow up. You need to grow up. You need to get You need to get over them. I don't mean get over them in an emotional way. I mean get up, get over them, arise over those situations. So I think the Lord is saying grow up. How do we grow? Let me give you five quick ways. Number one, uh, 1 Peter 2.2 2 says, As newborn babes desire earnestly, passionately desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So I would I'd challenge anybody and say, do you love Jesus? Yes, we all love Jesus. If Jesus and the Word are one, if Jesus is the Word and the Word is Jesus, how much time did we spend with Jesus today? How much time did we spend with the Word today? And I don't say that to condemn or to belittle or put down or devalue anybody. What I actually mean is that we, we should plan. If we don't plan to spend time with the Word, we're really planning to not spend time with the Word So number one, I would desire the sincere milk of the word. I mean, read brand new baby Christian, read through the gospels, read just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, read through the New Testament, you know, start at Genesis and read through. It's good to understand it and pick it and understand all those things. Check into my school of ministry for a greater understanding of the word. But the bottom line is read it. Just read it, read it. Desire the sincere milk. A baby doesn't understand the nutrients and the nourishment and the proteins Um, the carbs or whatever that are being passed to it through its mother's milk, but it needs it and it likes it and it causes it to grow. So the the word is milk. Yeah, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. The second key I'd say to grow is grow in fellowship with the Lord. This is a really big one. And I genuinely believe that (laughs) I'd say 99% of Christians are very little experiential fellowship with the Lord. You know, I I think most Christians, their only real warmth and fellowship and time they spend loving him is in church for half an hour or a lot less in some churches and um, walk with him, talk with him. The place to learn to hear God's voice is not in some conference or watching a Graham Jones YouTube video. It's, It's walking with God day by day by day, walk with him, talk with him, bring your frustrations to him, listen to him, fellowship with him. Spend time with him. Literally, fellowship, it means to be the same, to be fellows in a ship. <laughs> it means to be pulled together. You know, I sometimes say, uh, God wants to go on a road trip with you. When you're road tripping, you're fellows in a ship. It's like two guys stuck together in a car, you know, with 500 miles to travel. You talk, you know, you, you have conversations that it's hard to have in an, in an office or in a, a sim- small session. So, Road trip with Jesus, fellowship with Jesus. Good. Key number three, grow in love. And it's quite easy to love God because you're really, really lovely. But you really grow in love by loving people who are not lovely. It's called church. And God will make sure that you are not in a perfect church. And uh, he'll make sure. God wants you to be around people. People is where you learn to love. People is where you learn to love. So we can, we can be alone and I love you, Lord. And then God says, if you love me who you can't see, but you don't love your brother who you can't, James, um, y- your faith isn't that real. Now, it doesn't mean we don't 
we don't have a faith isn't real, but we're not being real with our faith. So I would say everybody should have a a home church, a community, people you're with at least once a week. I don't mean you don't go on vacation, but I mean, it's not this, I'll drop in once a month and say hi. There are no regional Christians. Yeah. You may have a lot of regional friends, but you have one family and one tribe. And the people you're with every week who know you, who know your kids, where well, you can do, you can heal the sick and cast out devils, but where you can take the trash out. Mm-hmm and clean the bathrooms and do whatever. And uh, so have a tribe and learn to love people. And in a way, we, we learn to do that when we, we're in a situation where we reach the end of our human love. That's where divine love starts, where you, you, you know, it's like Jesus said, Peter, do you, he really said, Peter, do you agape me? And Peter said, yes, I feel you. you. He's saying, G. Peter, Peter, do you love me with divine supernatural love? And Peter said, like, you're my friend. I, you're my companion. I love you with brotherly love, filio, uh, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. And it takes more than brotherly love. It takes heavenly love. So I would say we grow by growing in love. Find the person you find hard to love and ask God to teach you to love them. Go love them. Go bless them. Not because of what you can get out of it. Jesus said, we're no better than the Pharisees. If that's all we do, we love those who love us back. But we love unconditionally. We love with no thought or no ambition or no hope of return. That's what the master did. And we should walk even as he walks. Good. Uh, Key number four, how do we grow? We grow in our faith. Mm. So faith comes by hearing the word of God. But faith goes as well. Faith grows. You know, strength comes by eating good food. But uh, strength grows by usage, by exercise. So here's my challenge to you today. Learn about faith. I have some great teachings here. Did a series recently on how to grow in your faith. What are you using your faith for right now? Where is your faith invested? What have you believed you have received that your eyes have not yet seen and yet your heart's fully persuaded you already have? If that's a mouthful, press stop, rewind, and go back and hear it again, because it's an important thing. Where's your faith invested? Where are you using your faith for? Um, I think if we're not, if our faith is not invested in that way, we're not growing in faith. Again, you don't grow in faith simply by impartation. You grow in faith by using that faith. So I would say find something to believe God for. And in a way, one of the best things is when you believe God for other people. But find somebody who needs a hundred bucks and believe God for them. Find somebody who needs something, you know, that, that you don't have and just, just stretch out and believe God to, to meet that need. Yeah, I, I think we grow in faith. We go from faith to faith, from glory to glory. Start believing God for $100 to give and then believe him for two and then four and then five and then a thousand and start where you're at. Don't say one day I'll have great faith. It's really easy to read a book like, you know, the, the biographies of somebody like Wigglesworth. I love that man. And yet people would, you know, people used to come to him and say, how do you get great faith? And he'd always answer it, Mark 4, first the grain, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. He's basically saying a full corn, a harvest of um, corn comes from a tiny grain of corn and then a little sprout and then an ear and then the full corn in the ear. He's saying plant your faith, use your faith. You know, we, we get this crazy idea that Jesus wants little faith like a grain of mustard seed. When Jesus said have faith like a grain of mustard seed, he wasn't saying have a little faith because he Jesus rebuked people for having little faith. What Jesus was saying is have a faith that even if it's so small, you can plant it and it will grow. Come on, that's priceless. Boom. Hey, the last area we should grow in as well, and I'm going to do a whole new teaching series on this soon, so I know I can't unpack this, but grow in our our knowledge, our identity of ourselves as new creations. In a way, the whole of Christianity works like this. God's given you everything already. It's all done. It's all finished. It's all paid for. You've already got everything you'll ever need. And then what we need to do is grow in our understanding, the renewing of our mind, growing in our appreciation of who we are and what God's done. And if we don't grow up in our identity, we stay as babies. In a way, you're no longer a sinner, you're a new creation, but we need to grow in our understanding, our appreciation of that truth. Boom. So there's five areas we can grow in. Grow in the word, grow in fellowship with the Lord, grow in love, grow in your faith, and grow in your identity in Jesus Christ. Good. Well, I'm going to jump into another question right now. Tea again. Good. My next question today is actually a really easy one. Is why is there evil in the world? Okay. 
Now, I, I joke by saying this is an e easy one. I actually think it really is an easy question, but it's a hard it's a hard one to swallow because we've been, the world, if you will, has so mentored us and taught us these things. And it's like, literally, we are, we are like the, the person raising our fist to God. Why is there evil in this world? And I want to give you five quick perspectives on that that I believe will really help you answer. Um, at the end, I'll sum them up. I really encourage you to go through this, come back, write them down, write down your answers to them. Hey, if you disagree, come back to me in the comments below because I really mean this. I believe passionately what I'm saying to you here and I want to help people get free because one of these, frankly, these mindsets, these constructions of thoughts keep people away from God. They kept me away from God during a season in my life. And I'm really interested in helping people out of that. So why is there evil in the world? If you can, back off that question for a minute and let me ask you five questions, okay? I think these five questions will help you. If you'll think about them, you'll come to the right answer of why is there evil in the world? Okay, question number one, I'd ask you if you're asking that question. Um, do you agree that your question presupposes the existence of God? Okay, let me unpack that for a minute. Here's my premise. If there is no God, then there is no evil in the world. So if you're coming to that question as an atheist, saying there is no God, and there was a big bang, and uh, dust, and it rained on the rocks, and light, I don't know, lightning hit, and uh, proteins, you know, it's really, really hard to believe this stuff once you keep pulling on it. But here's the point. If you say that we evolved from primordial slime and that we're basically just organic machines, then if you are if you are basically, in effect, a postmodernist, uh, which is really where our generation sits, and says there is no there is no objective good or evil. If you and I went to Mars right now and looked at a bunch of rocks and said, this is a good rock, this is an evil rock, that would seem foolish. They're just rocks, okay? Adding water and slime and biological life and even consciousness doesn't change that. So if there is no God, then all, there's really no difference between you and I and a tree and an ant and a blade of grass and a rock. Okay, and that is, you cannot argue with that if you're coming from a secular atheist point of view. All you can say is that good or evil are, um, you know, evolutionary devices that we have brought into our consciousness over time to help us propagate the species. Or you can say that, you know, every nation decides this is good, this is evil. You know, we, we send people to Washington and they take a vote. But there's no intrinsic right or intrinsic wrong. Now, I reject that, but I'm saying if you don't believe in God, you have to believe that. Think on that one. Yeah, don't don't buy into the, uh, the kind of the Sam Harris esque. Well, there is some he tries to justify that there can be objective good. But, you know, it doesn't, uh, there's no, there's no foundation to it. If it's turtles all the way down, there's no good. It's really interesting in the, the trials at the Nuremberg um, court, you know, where they tried the Nazis after the Second World War. Some of the de defenses that people like Himmler, Hermann Goering, people like that, they came to the judges and they basically said, why do you get to impose your Anglo-Saxon, you know, American, British, Canadian or French justice, Russian justice, on us? They said, in a way, why, why do you get to sit in judgment of us? They said, you won the war, kill us if you want to, but don't pretend you're morally superior to us. You have your British laws, your American laws, your Canadian laws, Russian laws, whatever, and we had German laws. And they said, this is victor's justice, but it's not objective justice. And the, the uh, judges at the Nuremberg trials rightly answered and said, you know, they came back and they said, Above the law, there is a law. Above man's law, there is a law that nobody, you know, we have our human laws we make, but objectively there is, there is good, there is right. It's always wrong to kill the innocents in the way that you did. So, I, and number one, if there is no God, there is no good. <laughs> Your problem isn't even evil. You have a much bigger problem than that. There is no good. So the second question I'd ask you is this. When you say... That, that question, again, it sort of assumes if there's, if there's a God, why doesn't he do something about the evil? Okay, let me ask you the question. Let me return it to you. What would you like God to do? What would you like God to do about evil? So you and I could talk about, um, you know, genocide in Rwanda or in Syria currently, some of the things going on or whatever. But, but I would return the question to you and say, what would you actually like God to do? 
And normally, if you're like, like I am, like most of us are, what, I don't mean to be facetious by this because I know this is a, an important thing, but what we're usually saying is, well, we'd like God to come down from heaven, ride in on his white horse and put the evil right, okay? We'd like God to stop those nasty evil people, kill them, put them in chains, whatever, and set the innocent people free, okay? That's an interesting proposition, isn't it? Here's the, the challenge, the danger, though. If God's going to come and sort out the, the bad people, here's my third question. Where would God draw the line? Think about it that way. So if God's going to come and sort out all of the bad people, he's going to come and sort out the Hitlers and the, the Gehrings and the Paul Potts or whatever, what, does, what should God do with the Graham Joneses? What should God do with my kids? What should God do with you? What should God do with your kids? Because what most of us are saying is, God, um, go and sort out those nasty people over there, but I'm not really that bad. I'm basically okay. I'm better than the average bird. I'm not as bad as those people out there. And here's the thing, though. Where does God draw the line? Because the problem is we, when we draw a line, we say there's good people like me, and then there's the nasty people over there. Most of us would say there's a, there's the saintly Mother Teresa's, Billy Graham's, I don't know, Gandhi's, and then there's the Hitler's, the Pol Pot's, and then there's your average Joe like you and I. But God looks at all of us and says, if I'm going to come and sort out bad people, I'm going to sort out all of you. And in a way, what we want is we want God to intervene in human history and stop genocide in Rwanda. But we don't want God to turn up in my house or yours and make us uh, be absolutely honest about our taxes, never have a lustful thought, never lie, never be selfish, never. We have our sins that we're OK with. And then we, we look and we say there's these other bad things out there. And I think you see, the problem is God looks at all of it. So my, here's my fourth question. Would it be okay if God started with you? So if God was going to come and annihilate every bad person and put every bad thing right on planet Earth, are you okay if he starts with you? Are you okay if he starts with your kids or me or my kids? Yeah. And my last real question to this is, have you, have you really understood the plan of salvation and rejected it? Or have you heard a cliche of it? Because what the real plan of salvation says is God, God's not... God's not like you think he is. He's a million times better than that. He's more just. He's more righteous. God is better in terms of his goodness, but he's also more holy, more righteous than you or I are. We, it, we get indignant when we see evil things happening, but God is a million times more than that. And the Bible says God is coming really soon and he will call every single person to account on planet Earth. He'll call the Hitlers, the Paul Potts, but he's going to put Mother Teresa, Billy Gray and Gandhi, and he's going to put me and my kids and you and your family not on trial. That's not his will, if you will. Here's the point. He's going to come and bring order to everything. But the amazing news is he did something that I'd never be willing to do. Rather than God looks at the, the worst people in the world and the best people in the world, and he knows they all deserve his justice. And what he did, the Bible says he sent his son. I have two sons. I love my sons. I may love you. I may know you watching this video, but I'm not sure I'd have my children die for you. And that's what God did. God reconcile justice and mercy. The Bible says mercy and justice kissed in Jesus Christ. And God has paid that price already. You know, C.S. Uh, Lewis, the author, he once said, when you're watching a theater piece, when you see the author step on the stage, the play is over. And the day will come soon when the author of life and death is gonna step on the stage and he's gonna put every single thing right. He's going to call to account every evil person, but he's also going to call to account me and the. <laughs> and the issue, that's my question to you to end with, is what, do, what have you done with that message? You see, it's really easy to say, God, go and sort out the other people. And God says, I want to start with you. What have you done to help? What have you done to, to bring righteousness? What have you done with the gift of my son? Have you rejected him or have you accepted him? So my quick answer to you, I know it's a big subject, is this. There are evil on the world because there's evil in the world because there are evil people in the world. But I, outside of Jesus, am an evil person. My kids are, their kids will be, you are, your family is. We, we have a choice. We all, like sheep, have gone astray.
and God sent his son to rescue us. So God is not your problem. If you think you're righteous, getting angry about, um, you know, things going wrong in the world, God is a million times more than that. But God did something about it. He provided the answer. He sent his son to die for you. Boom. So let me give over those questions again. Really think about these. Number one, do you, is it possible to believe in good and evil if there is no God? My answer is no. Please contradict me in the comments below. <laughs> Great. Number two, what would you like God to do about evil in the world? Number three, where would you draw the line between the evil that God should sort out and the evil that God should wink at and just brush under the carpet and forget about? Yeah. Come on. Key number four, is it okay if God starts this process with you? Do you, do you actually really want God to come and take over your life and your thoughts and every single thing that he, not that you, but that he considers right or wrong in your life? Is that what you really want or you just want God to do it on somebody else? And lastly, have you understood the gospel and rejected it? Because if you haven't, you can do that right now. I just encourage you, open your heart, call on God's name and he's there. Say, God, I'm a sinner. I'm an evil person. Would you come and rescue me? Would you come and sort me out? And the Bible says he's near to all who call on him. Good. Hey, I'm going to move on here. But if you need some help, drop a comment below. We'd love to pray for you and provide you with some resources that would help you in that area. In Jesus name. Boom. Good. Question number three today is, does God predestine everything? Does God predestine everything? Good question. Um, yes and no. I think in a way the, the, the point is what do we mean by predestined, predestination. Predestined, the word literally comes to preordain. Uh, we talk about destiny, where we're going, our destination, destiny. So to have a predetermined destiny. Um, I, I think a lot of the problems people have with this, uh, not the question, but the answer is, is what we're sometimes talking about different things. So let, let me unpack that a little bit. Does God predestine everything? Number one, um, there's nothing God doesn't know about. God knows about every single thing that will ever happen, the thought processes behind it. He's everything's open and unveiled uh, before him with whom we have to deal with. So God knows absolutely everything, number one. Um, God is sovereign over everything. I think that would be a better way of understanding this. So there's nothing that, that in a way is outside of God's orbit that God is incapable of doing. There's no situation that God can't in a way reach in and do. Um, and before God ever does everything, you know, in, in ages past, I, I think in a way a lot of this, the problem with this question is our thinking. I think the Bible talks about God being outside of time. Time itself is a creation. So God isn't sort of watching this going by, simply knowing what will happen in future. But God is completely outside time. In one way, God's living before time ever began right now. And God's also living after time gets wrapped up. So God knows everything that will happen. I think the danger with the, that question is sometimes what we imply, what a lot of people, you know, Calvinists will imply is this idea that because God is all powerful and because God knows everything, then in a way we're implying God is the, it's got, everything is God's choice, that God is responsible for everything. And in a sense, there's some truth in that. In a sense, that's really untrue. So right now, you know, I have a hot cup of tea in my hand, British tea. Yeah. If I were to spill this tea all over my Bible, let me ask you a question. Did God predestine that to happen? Um, I, again, I come back at it and say yes and no. Does God, is it God's fault that there's tea all over my Bible? Or is that my fault? I was clumsy. I did something. You know, if I, I won't by the way, but if I were to hit somebody with my vehicle driving home from my office today, you know, by God's grace, I never will. But is it, is it because God predestined that to happen? Let's just unpack that for a minute. God, when he created the world, knew that in creating the world, tea would be spilt on a Bible or a child would be hit by a car or that somebody would choose to spend eternity without God. God knew all of those things. So if you want to look at it from this point of view, God said, I'm going to choose to create this universe knowing that at some place along the pathway of history, this thing will happen. So if you want to say God's responsible for that, I guess you can in the sense of he ultimately 
set that thing into being. But that I don't think that means that he wished that to happen and he was the cause of that. In fact, he's not the cause of it. He's the solution to all of those things. So if you're sick today watching this, don't buy into the lie, well, God chose this to happen for a deep reason. Yeah, God chose there to be a universe and he knew this would happen. But what God's saying to you today is, I am the Lord, your healer. God's saying, learn to drive well, but I'm going to give you grace that you won't hit somebody. God's saying, hold your cup of tea well and it won't spill on the Bible. So just because God's all powerful and God knows everything, I think we, we make a jump. We make two and two, not into four, but into 27 when we suddenly say, well, therefore, God's responsible for everything. And, and wishes it to be that way. The Bible speaks about many things that God wishes to happen that will not happen. The Bible says there will be people, you know, a sheep and a goat's a parting of the ways at the end of eternity. There'll be people who choose to live without God for eternity. Satan and his angels, but also some people who choose to make Satan and his angels the Lord of their lives. But, you know, uh, First Timothy said God wishes that none would perish and that all would come to the knowledge of the truth. When Jesus says, come unto me, he says, all you who are heavy laden. He's not saying, come unto me, but I'll take you, I'll love you, I love you not, I love you, I love you not. So I think we've got to eradicate that false religious idea and come back to the Bible. Um, I, th I look at it this way. I think God has glorious plans and incredible destinies for for planet Earth, you know, in his son, but also for every single one of us. In a way, I think God, we need to look at this relationally, not informationally. So I have three children. You may have children watching this. What's my plan for my children? My plan for the children is that they'd flourish, that they'd do well. My ultimate wish is that they'd walk in the light of the Lord all the days of their lives. They'd walk in joy and righteousness. I want them to marry the right people. I want them to do well in life, but I also don't want them to live in bondage to money. I want them to succeed, but I don't want to decide you have to be a doctor, a lawyer. You have to go to this school or that school. I want them to be the best version of who they can be. Now, on the journey of their lives, imagine if... Imagine again, I'm going to proclaim this will never happen. Imagine if one of my children were married and then that marriage fell apart. Their partner cheated on them. They left them, met somebody else. And they ended up getting divorced. Would I look, my, here's the point. My will is going to be redemptive. No matter where they've gone, no matter if like the prodigal, they choose to go and live in a pigsty and live far away. I'm going to always want to say, no matter what you've done, my, my will my predestined will for you is that we forgive and heal whatever you've done and bring you back to the best. So in a sense, God has his will. You know, his will is Christ Jesus. His will is, you know, us keeping all of his rules and things like that. But it, he knew we wouldn't do that. So I think God's will is prescriptive, but God's will is also redemptive. So to answer that question, yes, I believe it, God's sovereign, that God predestines things. It just depends what we mean by that. Boom. Good. My next question today is a really good one, and I'm actually going to do a series about this within the next week or two, so watch out for that. Uh, here's the question. Can a Christian live free from sin? Hmm. What do you think? Um, I think the glory, like, again, let me just unpack the answer a little bit because somebody's going to hear me for 30 seconds and make a YouTube post about what a heretic I am. I, I think the answer has to be yes. I think God calls us to walk like Jesus. 1 John 2 verse 6 says we should walk even as he walked. 1 John 4 17 says as he is so are we in the world and I think the life Jesus gave up literally his life, his existence, his nature, everything at Calvary that he might have it back in your life and mine. Mm. The son of God became the son of man that the sons of men might become the sons of God. So I think there is a glorious possibility from you and I living free from sin. Okay, let me set this out. So number one, I believe yes. Number two, I haven't made it yet. Hmm. I think the Apostle Paul, when he writes, he talks about the, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And then Paul says the same thing. He says, you know what, guys, I haven't made it. But he doesn't do the, well, we're, all, we're, only, we're only human, one day at a time, sweet Jesus. He says, I haven't yet made it. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, I press. I do everything I can to, to stand in that fullness. You know, I think a great book and epistle to read on this is 1 John. 1 John's really powerful, talking about Christianity, maturity, freedom from sin. 
And John says this, he says that if we say we have no sin, come on, we deceive ourselves. But then he says, if we confess our sins, God's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us all in righteousness. And then he says in 1 John 2 and in 1 John 3, he that is, or she, the, he that is born of God does not sin. Now think about that. He that is born of God does not sin. And I, again, I, I want to do a series on this because there's a lot to unpack there. Here's what my understanding of that would be. I think what what John is saying there is, guys, you are new creations, and the new creation does not sin. In a way, God did this. When in Adam we died, yeah, in Christ we're made alive, Romans 8 verse 10. The spirit is alive because of righteousness. Your spirit died in Adam, your spirit was made alive in Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians six seventeen says, he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. So here's the thing, when Jesus died, you died. Again, read, you know, I won't have the time to quote the whole thing, but Romans 6 talks about knowing this, that our old man was crucified with Christ, that the body of sin might be destroyed. It says, henceforth, we should not serve sin. Romans 6 says, he that is dead is free from sin. So in God's eyes, in God's economy, from God's perspective, your old man is completely dead. I'm talking to you as a believer right now, and you are a new creation. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, everything has become new. So God looks at you and says, your old person, that sinful man, that dark passenger is dead. I nailed him to the cross of Calvary. He's been buried in the waters of baptism. That's why you need to be baptized and raised in newness of life. And you are now seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So God looks at you and I and he sees new creations. He sees uh, brand new people with the nature of God freed from sin. Okay, pause. Let's look at the other movie. We here on planet earth living in 2019 as I do this video, but Hopefully 2029 when somebody else is watching it. <laughs> Come on, we're, we're trapped in space and time. We're walking this out on the world. So let me, let me unpack that again. Do we have a sin nature? I think we don't. I think we have a righteousness nature. We have a new creation nature. I think our problem is this. We have a sin habit. We have a sin mindset. We've, we've, our challenge, if you will, is not to, we don't have to crucify ourselves. Again, Romans 6 says, reckon, account yourself as dead to sin and alive to God. So it's not my job to kill my old nature, but it is my job to come to the word of God and believe what God says in me. It's my job, 1 Corinthians 15, 34, awake to righteousness and you won't sin. So my job is to believe what God said. My job is to wake up every day. You know, it says, um, where is it? Ephesians 4, 23 and 24. It says, put off the old man with all of his ways. How? By believing by faith that he's dead. And then it says, put on the new man created after God in righteousness and true holiness. And then Paul tells you how to put on the new man. He says, by being renewed in the spirit of your mind. So our challenge is every day to, if you will, to wake up and to remind ourselves, I'm, a, I'm dead to the world, I'm dead to sin. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. Oh, but yet I live. Ah, but not I. Christ, Christos, Christ lives in me. And the life I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. So our job, in a way, is to the, the progression, the work of sanctification is not to try to become holy, but learn to think holy. It's to realize, Colossians 1.13, that we've already been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the son that he loves. We've arrived. You've arrived, baby. What we need to do is learn to think, learn to speak, learn to learn the habits of this new culture. You know, I'm a Brit, as you can tell by my accent, but i um, but seven years now, I moved over to live in America, and I'm learning to talk American, y'all. I'm learning to say gas, not petrol, and tomato, not tomato. I'm uh, learning to drive on the right and not the left. I've, I've, I've got to function in a new kingdom, and that's our challenge. So God says this, as a new creation, you don't have to sin. The he that is born of me does not sin. But then he says, if we sin we have an advocate with the Father, Christ Jesus the righteous. So it would be like having an unsinkable boat that had life rafts on it. It's unsinkable 
So in a way, God gives us his promises. You walk with me, you won't sin. But he says, but if you miss it, if you get it wrong, if you step back into that old creation, if you don't walk in the perfection I've got for you, we have an advocate, Christ Jesus the righteous. So I think our call every day is to wake up and remind who we are. Our job when we're tempted is not to try to resist. I resist that temptation with my, my willpower, but rather to resist it by a higher temptation that's the beauty of Jesus but also to resist sin by saying that's not who I am you know there are things I don't do uh, because that's not who I am you know I was involved in a situation it's actually going on right now in my building here about helping somebody in need and um, you know my point is I'm not going to do something because of the accolades or somebody's going to be pleased with me or not I want to know I want to who am I this is what I want to do. I don't care what anybody else thinks of what I do or don't do. But I want to do the right thing because it's who I am. If you can get to the place, come on, if you're trying to get free from sin, trying to get free from a habit, from anger, from selfishness, from lust, from all of these things, when you can get to the place that says, I, that's not who I am. I'm better than that. I'm a new person. Never mind the consequences of sin. I am not that person. So find out who you are in Christ and you can live above sin. But if you miss it, we have an advocate. Run to him, not run from him. You know, again, well, I'll, I'll cover that in this series. Sometimes people say, should Christians repent of sin? Yes. If I sin, if I miss it, I run to God. Father, I love you. I'm dumb. I did that thing again. And, and he receives me, welcomes me. It's when, when there's a difference between an act of sin and the practice of sin. I think the challenge there is when a believer is saying, no, I have my little sin habit and I like it and I'm not changing this and God, you've got to accept me the way I am and I'm not going to stop this and I want you to celebrate my sin. That's when we're in danger. That's when God starts drawing back from us. Mm. So yes, I believe as a Christian, you can live over sin. Boom. <laughs> good. Uh, last question here today, and it's a good one again. Um, you know, I actually have another series coming out next week about answer prayer. Here's the question. The question is this. Why are my prayers not answered? Hmm. Great question. Let me give you the five-minute version. Um, hmm. I think there's really three simple answers to that. Number one. There are times when our prayers aren't answered because we're simply asking for the wrong things. We're asking for something outside of God's will. James says in James chapter 4, he speaks about answered prayer. And he says, you have not because you ask not. And he says, you have not also because you ask amiss that you may consume it on your lusts. So if you're asking God for something that's outside of his will, outside of his plan, outside of his purposes, um, yeah you're probably not going to get if i want 200 jet planes and i believe i receive them by faith and they don't come um god never promises me 200 jet planes now be careful because what you, some of you are about to do is think oh yeah those tv maybe there is somebody who needs 200 jet planes maybe you're a christian who's called to own a jet line and um, god bless you you know, if you need that, I don't think God's um, against you having a great car or a great plane or a great... Well, anything you need, you know, anything you need for life and ministry or anything that you need that you can hold to the glory of God and put at the disposition of God in his kingdom. I don't think God's got any problem with anybody having anything. The earth is the Lord, the fullness thereof. Okay, so I, I would say this. There are some things in his word that are clearly promised to us that we can pray with confidence. There are some things, though, that we need to come and we, need, we should be saying, Lord, do you want me to have this, Father? Can I? Is this the right thing for me to ask for? So sometimes asking God, uh, can I ask this? Um, finding out if it is his will before you pray. I think sometimes our prayers aren't answered because we're asking things that God never promised we'd have. Yeah. If my 17-year-old daughter comes and says, Daddy, would you get me a car? I will say, let's talk. I won't just go out and buy you a car, but I'll help you buy one, and we'll work through that process. And if, you, if we work together, you're going to have a car real soon. If my 8-year-old comes and says, Daddy, will you buy me a car? I'm going to say, I'll order you one this big on Amazon, and you can play with it in the yard. It's a different conversation. So number one, ask a miss. I think number two, these are, these are minor details, but they're important. Uh, we don't, our prayers aren't answered at times because of the disposition of our heart. So Jesus really clearly says that when you pray, you know, most people know Mark 11, 23, Mark 11, 24. Mark 11, 25 hardly ever gets quoted. And in Mark 11, 25, Jesus says, if, if when you pray you have anything against anybody, God won't even bother listening. 
So when we come and we have unforgiveness, strife in our heart, it can kill your prayer. It's like God goes, can't hear you, can't hear you. God won't listen to those things. So if you come and you're praying for something that's right, that's biblical, that God wants you to have, but the disposition of your heart um, is wrong. You know, the Bible talks about husbands and wives when they're not in unity and they're in strife. And um, usually the responsibility is more on the husband where, you know, speaking harsh words. God says your prayers won't be answered because of the way you're treating your wife. Sometimes I'll go to God and I'm trying to be all lovey-dovey with God. And God says, go be lovey-dovey with your wife. You know, text her and say, I'm sorry for that rude word. I'm sorry I was offensive. So having your heart right, um, again, unforgiveness is a big one there. You know, resentment, rejection can stop our prayers being answered. Again, let, let me drill down on this one as well and hear me well in this. I think sin can stop our prayers being answered. And that's not usually that God's saying, I won't answer your prayer because you've got sin in your heart. But what's usually going on when we've got sin in our heart, it's really hard to believe. Uh, 1 John 3, 19 and 20 says... If we ask anything according to his will, we have the petition we desire of him. If you ask anything according to God's will, God says, yes, you've got it, baby. But then the next verse says, if our hearts condemn us, how can we have confidence towards God? How can we have faith if our hearts are condemning us? So sometimes we'll come into God and pray for something that is his will, but our, because of sin in our life, our own hearts say, no, no, God won't answer your prayers. And it's not God's problem. It's actually in our hearts. I think the third reason, this is a quick overview. I say I'd check out the series I'm going to do next week on this. But uh, why are our prayers not answered? I think the faith thing is because we don't understand faith. So often we pray and when we don't see it happen in the way we think it does, we think God hasn't answered our prayer. And I, I would challenge you on that. The very fact somebody says, if somebody comes to my office right now and says, I prayed and God didn't answer. You know what that tells me? It tells me they believe. It tells me they stopped believing. It tells me they started believing. But at some time, they shifted their faith from the promise of God to what was not happening. And now their faith is in the fact something that they believe the prayer is not being answered because they don't see it, smell it, feel it, taste it and touch it. If they were in faith, I would go, how are you doing? They would say, my prayer is answered. And I could say, how do you know your prayer is answered? They could, God's given me his word. Heaven and earth will pass away. He watches over his word waiting to perform it. So often it's not that people don't have faith. I've never said to anybody in my entire life, you don't have enough faith. But I have to say to 99% of people, you don't know how to use your faith. You're misunderstanding what faith really is. So I think there's a really powerful lesson there when we'll, again, I would go back and read Mark 11 about 50 times until it really sinks down into you. Here's the point. When, you, when you're waiting for something to happen, you don't believe it's happened. In Mark 11, Jesus curses the fig tree and walks away. And the disciples are looking at the tree and basically the disciples are saying to themselves, it didn't work. The tree's still alive. And if you would have stopped Jesus on his way to Jerusalem and said, Jesus, are you losing your touch? That tree you cursed is still alive. Jesus would have said, no, it's dead. And then imagine you would have said, yeah, but I've, I've just seen it two minutes ago. It's still alive. It's all green. It's flourishing. Jesus would have said, no, no, I spoke the words. That tree is dead. It may not look dead, it may not smell dead, it may seem alive, but I believe I received, past tense, received, not going to receive. I believe I've received the thing I prayed for. And then Jesus says at the end of them, you know, if you'll, what things you desire, when you pray, believe you have received it, and then you'll see it happen. It's so simple, but it's your job and my job to believe we have received and it's God's job to make it happen. And whenever we believe we have received the Holy Spirit will start producing those things in our results. The danger is when we put our faith in what we see or don't see, we often let go of what we have received. De. Let me give you a quick example. I'll finish with this, but it's a powerful one. This is why many people get half healed. I remember years ago praying with somebody with like racked with pain and arthritis. And I said, hey, we're going to pray. We're going to tell the arthritis to go. We bound that thing in the name of Jesus, commanded it to go. And then the, here's the point, the pain, let's say the pain was at 100%. The pain started going down and down and the joints began freeing up. 
and the person got really excited this i haven't felt this great in years oh it's beginning to free up i can make a fist i can do the things and suddenly it's like the healing stopped and they came to me the next day and they say they said i got half healed what happened now they said really happy with that but uh and i went to the lord and here's what the lord said they came they believed my promise they held my promise of 100% healing in their faith. So I started producing that in their experience. But on the journey, as it began to be produced in their experience, the faith shifted from it is written into I feel 50% better. And they, they went away believing they were healed, duh, not because of it is written, but because of I feel much better. And that sounds crazy to say, but your, if your faith is it, I feel much better, you're in danger. Keep your faith in the Word of God. It's great to say, wow, I can, I'm much better, but what we've got to do is anchor our faith in, but I've received 100% healing by the Word of God. Boom. So just some thoughts, Sarah, on why our prayers are not answered. Um, good. Hey, let me do a couple of more housekeeping things here. I'm going to be back with some more videos this week on the uh, public gifts of the Spirit, prophecy, tongues, interpretation. I have a practical video this week on uh, which Bible version should we read and i've got some more teachings soon coming up on um again six steps to answered prayer gonna be good hey a uh, couple of things if you haven't yet subscribed for our email newsletter i have a a cd set i'm sending away free to everybody who does that if you go to gjm.org forward slash offer gjm.org forward slash offer we'd love to send that to you and again please consider subscribing hit the red button down there and give the bell a long press two or three seconds and that will put you as part of our YouTube subscriber club. <laughs> Great. Thanks for watching. Thanks to all my partners as well who uh, help this ministry, help us do what we're doing here. Uh, we're trying to raise up some money to buy some new video equipment. So if anybody wants to sew into that, that would be much appreciated. Uh, if you're not yet a partner, again, go to gjm.org and there'll be a thing there on partnership. We'd love to have you on board. Thanks for watching, guys. Walk in the spirit. Walk with Jesus. Walk in the word work the word. We love you. See you soon. Bye for now.